I think that uh, for all of our efforts, however, so far, this country doesn't really fully uh, understand and appreciate, frankly, the Italian-American commitment here and uh, what Italian-Americans have meant to the United States. I think one of the unfortunate things has been the fascination that the American population has and other populations for the mafia, the camorra, for organized crime, and uh, that, that's something that we've had to struggle against for a long time. But thanks to the efforts of our forefathers, uh, people like my mother and father who came here from Salerno, Nuceri Inferior, and uh, Tramonti, without any money, without any education, we're just eager to get an education for their children. Thanks to them, we're now making wonderful progress. Happy New Year from Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. For immigrants worldwide, life is a struggle beyond what most people can imagine or recall from their own ancestors' histories. But sometimes, within the parameters of this society, there can be small breakouts and victories. For Italian-Americans, even if for the mere fact that he was Italian-American and that he honored his status as the child of immigrants, Governor Mario Cuomo was one such example. To commemorate the late statesman, our John Calvelli, Executive Vice President of both the Wildlife Conservation Society and the National Italian American Foundation, Joseph Shami, Vice President for Community Relations at St. John's University and Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of major Italian American organizations, and Jeannie Zaino, Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Iona College. The phrase that will ever forever be associated with Mauro Cuomo is you campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. And I think we can say that for the poetry one need only think back to the 1984 speech at the Democratic Convention that I think we can dub a tale of two cities. Mm -hmm. Ten days ago, President Reagan admitted that although some people in this country seem to be doing well nowadays, others were unhappy, even worried about themselves, their families, and their futures. The President said that he didn't understand that fear. He said, why, this country is a shining city on a hill. Mr. President, you ought to know that this nation is more a tale of two cities than it is just a shining city on a hill. Maybe, Mr. President, if you asked a woman who had been denied the help she needed to feed her children because you said you needed the money for a tax break for a millionaire or for a missile we couldn't afford to use. You hear the people in the room, you feel how much that speech meant to them. It was almost like he articulated something that so many Democrats at the time were thinking and feeling and nobody was saying. There's probably thousands of, of young people at the time who were, um, who were brought into government because of, of him, his stirring words, and what he stood for. And then the one instead that did have a title at the University of Notre Dame that was religious belief and public morality, a Catholic governor's perspective. My church and my conscience require me to believe certain things about divorce, about birth control, about abortion. My church does not order me, under pain of sin or expulsion, to pursue my salvific mission according to a precisely defined political plan. Those who endorse legalized abortions aren't a ruthless, callous alliance of anti-Christians determined to overthrow our moral standards. In many cases, the proponents of legal abortion are the very people who have worked with Catholics to realize the goals of social justice set out by popes in encyclicals. He got in trouble here in 84, right, with the, with the Bishop of New York, the Archbishop of New York. It was a very uh, tense time, yeah. and uh, I think uh, each side stuck stuck to its, uh, to its position. You know, most people looking at it say the 1984 convention speech was one of the best speeches ever given in the 20th century. You know, one of certainly the top 10 speeches. And, uh, you know, as much as I love that speech, I actually think that the Notre Dame speech was even, uh, you know, more important in some ways politically and socially. Surely one of the best speakers of the 20th century 
up there with Martin Luther King and JFK. As we think back in these first few weeks after his passing, his legacy in general, uh, his legacy specifically to Italian Americans, what comes to mind? Mario Cuomo was an awakening. Uh, it was a sense that Italian Americans could run uh, for higher office and get elected. I mean, let's not forget, he was the first Italian American, elected Italian American governor in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible statement um, that li literally 30 years ago, this man made history by just doing that fact. He was a complex person. Um, and his, uh, I remember once in a conversation uh, following the Notre Dame discussion that he made it clear, you know, I have five children. How do you think I stand about this issue? Yeah. However, I'm still the governor, yeah. and I must enforce the law. He really, you know, seemed to what I think of as not so much created a new progressive or pragmatic progressive approach to politics that some people talk about, but I think he really hearkened back. And at a time when we were in the middle of the quote unquote Reagan revolution and you had new Democrats like Bill Clinton coming to the forefront, you had Mario Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, come out and say, look it, I think we need to take a step back. Even though this isn't popular to say now, I am going to remind us all about what we, you know, what the New Deal meant, what the progressive movement meant. He set the tone for government in the late uh, 20th century. Mm -hmm. He was um, the, the one side of the coin, and let's say and Nino Scalia was the other side of that coin. Mm -hmm. But the sense of an activist government, um, the sense that you could make uh, real positive changes through government. And then uh, the other major issue, which you alluded to in the Notre Dame speech, how, does, uh, ca how do Catholics govern in a uh, multicultural, uh, multi-party society, in yeah. a democratic society? There is neither an encyclical nor a catechism that spells out a political strategy for achieving legislative goals. We can be fully Catholic, proudly, totally at ease with ourselves, a people in the world transforming it, a light to this nation, appealing to the best in our people and not the worst, persuading, not coercing, leading people to truth by love, and still all the while respecting and enjoying our unique pluralistic democracy. And we can do it even as politicians. In the Notre Dame speech, he really touched on an issue that so many Democratic politicians and also Republican politicians find themselves in, in this kind of, you know, difficult position between the state and the public and their public role and their private beliefs. The governor helped to reframe the conversation about the role of religion and literally set he had one perspective and another, and these were difficult times. He was a mentor, and if you were younger, you know, you couldn't help but be impressed by him. His words, his manner of presentation, he was forceful. He had a message, and uh, the message that obviously has been recorded many times was his story about the mosaic. What is this neutral creature that you make in the melting pot? So the melting pot won't do. Take a look at that church window. I mean, look at how beautiful it is and look very closely at it. It's made up of different pieces, different sizes, different shapes, and different colors. It's called a mosaic. And the beauty of the mosaic is that when you marry those individual pieces that are different in size, different in shape, different in color, when you harmonize them, as you harmonize the people of the United States through the Constitution, if you do it properly, then you get the maximum beauty out of them. So you're, you are an Italian and you stay an Italian and you are Egyptian, and you are black, and you are a Jew, and you stay that way, and you add it to all the other distinctive elements. So there we are. We are a mosaic. And I love the reference, actually, to the church window. Yes. I thought that was a very interesting uh, way of making that point. Mm -hmm. And as, we, as you referenced earlier about the uh, Notre Dame speech, I think yeah. in his mind he's always kind of thinking about these things in the same way and yeah. trying to figure out how do you marry these concepts together. Uh, but that was, that was the brilliance yeah. of Mario Cuomo. The 1984 speech, he spoke a lot about his parents. I watched a small man with thick calluses on both his hands work 15 and 16 hours a day. I saw him once literally bleed from the bottoms of his feet. A man who came here uneducated, alone, 
unable to speak the language, who taught me all I needed to know about faith and hard work by the simple eloquence of his example. I learned about our kind of democracy from my father, and I learned about our obligation to each other from him and my mother. They asked only for a chance to work and to make the world better for their children. I've always seen that as sort of, when, when you think of the generation of Italian immigrants who came here at the beginning of the 20th century and their children, the, the idea of being Italian was really something you kept at home. And when you went out into greater society, you were quote unquote American. And I think in that speech, he really sort of underscored the validity or that it was okay, gave people permission to be Italian and to be American. He made it acceptable to be Italian American. In a real way, we all have had those moments in our lives where people question your ethnicity, mm -hmm. um, who you were, what you were. He was told to consider changing his name yes. at one point when he was in law school, that he had so much difficulty being number one in his class, had so much difficulty getting an interview on Wall Street, and so much of that and other examples of discrimination that he faced. Mary Cuomo bridged the different period of, let's say, my own grandparents, those who died in, in the 50s, and then my own parents. Mm -hmm. And um, they were proud, number one, always to be American. Mm -hmm. And they didn't talk much about their ethnicity. They blended in this supposed melting pot, which we turned out not to be. Mm -hmm. And then Mario comes forth, and he has this strong message about family. Yeah. And he recounts the story over and over again about the mother and father struggling, working, succeeding, helping him through school. Others who followed him used that same message. If we recount Alphonse D'Amato, his mother became part of his campaign. Mm -hmm. Even Governor Pataki always had his mother at his side. Before that, I'm not so sure that was the case. Mm -hmm. So Mario really was not afraid to speak about his ethnicity. You know, for Italian Americans, when he not only became a lawyer and this great mediator in these housing disputes, but he decided to run for mayor and ultimately became lieutenant governor, that it was this kind of, you know, moment when Italian Americans said, you know, we can do this. We can absolutely rise, regardless of any discrimination, regardless of, you know, how people see us or have seen us. We can be a part and make a difference in the public realm. And so I think he'll always stand for that. For not just Italian Americans, I think so many people, immigrants who come to this country and find themselves facing a similar type of discrimination and a similar type of struggle. The one stain on the media has really, uh, during that period, was this whole fascination with, with organized crime and his involvement. There was no involvement. There was nothing. He chose not to run for president mm -hmm. of the United States. He made a, a conscious choice not to do that. Um, but that was the kind of man that he was. He stood by his principles. He knew who he was and he knew who he wasn't, what he wanted to be. And um, I think he, um, as many good Italian-American fathers, uh, lives vicariously through his children. Mm -hmm. And uh, what an incredible group of accomplished individuals that he has that, um, that he's left us with. I can't imagine how Mario Cuomo must have felt both in 2010 and then in 2014 to see his son in this position, you know, elected for a second time. And not just because it's his son, but because of another, you know, Italian-American Italian and not facing nearly, due to his father's work, not facing nearly the kind of close analysis in that way that other people did. And he was one of the first ones also with uh, very interested in the, um, the lighting of the Empire State Building for Columbus Day weekend. Most people don't realize that he was right there at the forefront of that with his gatherings on the Friday nights before the weekend even began and always with proclamation ceremonies and there in the forefront. He was a presence. And uh, I brought along a little clip um, back in 1986. It was the centennial of the Statue of Liberty. And uh, I had uh, been one of the founders of a group called Fieri, which is the Italian word for pride. It was a young professionals group. And uh, his daughter, Maria Cuomo, uh, at the time became chair of this event. And we raised money to help restore the Statue of Liberty. And what he said there was amazing and really electrified this group of over 500 young Italian-Americans. This is an exciting idea, Fieri. You launched it. You've made it a success very quickly. See, something occurred over the last 20 or so years with hardly a lot of notice, except perhaps in New York. We went from the melting pot to the mosaic. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there were a lot of people who would be embarrassed 
to say, hey, look, I'm an American, but I'm an Italian, too. I'm an American, but I'm an Asian, too. I'm an American, but I'm an African, too. There were a lot of people who felt that there was something antipathetic about that, that in order to be a true American, you had to shed your previous culture, forget your roots, go jumping into that seething cauldron called the melting pot, boil away all your distinctions and prove, produce some new stereotype American. It's not like that. Now we have a better intelligence, a greater wisdom. And the wisdom is that we're better as a nation when we pledge allegiance to the idea of America, the idea of inclusion, while at the same time maintaining the strength of our own culture. That's what you say in Fieri. That's what you say when you use the word pride. There you go, ethnic pride. <laughs> but you know, the, the great uh, thing uh, about the ethnic pride that he espoused was that it yeah. wasn't just being Italian, yeah. Yeah. that you could be proud of who you were, right. that the sense of being an American, there were a set of ideals of what it meant to be an American, but what we all brought was our own distinctive culture and heritage to that great mosaic. And, and as Joe referenced, this idea of family, this idea mm -hmm. that we are a family. And, and Maria would always joke as we were getting this event together, we're standing on the soldiers, uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. great America, great giants, giants. right? It was mm -hmm. always this thing of, you know, we have to give back to that generation before and the sacrifices that they made. And that truly is not just an Italian story. That's really uh, mm -hmm. almost every immigrant. I don't, there's not one immigrant story that is going to be different. What we brought really were a set of values as Italian Americans. And I think to, to Mario Cuomo's great success is many of those fundamental concepts are now, as Joe mentioned, uh, considered a part of, of the American milieu when you think about family, um, in the sense of being proud of who you are. I mean, um, the fact that you can say you are Italian-American or African-American. Mm -hmm. Realize these were interesting times where you could blend these two concepts together. He did a few firsts as governor of the state of New York, right? He, he appointed the first two female judges. He appointed the first African-American judge and the first um, Hispanic judge to the Court of Appeals, for example. In New York. He absolutely did a lot of work on women's issues, both in terms of his appointments and also in terms of setting up, for instance, he set up a commission partly in, in, in regard to, you know, legislative reform to look at harassment um, that was going on both in, uh, you know, the public sector universities and colleges in New York and also in the legislature. He looked at issues like sexual harassment and at the time that was something that was groundbreaking. He um, set up a series of goals, conversation, uh, conservational and also environmental goals in general and things of that sort. People seem to forget about those things. There were a number of firsts, the, the decade of the child, for example, and the whole idea of mentoring that then his wife, Matilda Cuomo, took on. I had the, the pleasure of working with Matilda early on and Mrs. Cuomo. We went to Italy in 1987 uh, for the, uh, actually it was a, a conference on the Italian language mm -hmm. and she, of course, being uh, the woman that she was used it also as an opportunity to focus on mentoring and uh, the Mentoring USA program that she created which still exists um, that was the kind of, of family approach that the, the Cuomo's took at that time you mentioned um, the environment the environmental protection fund was created the natural heritage trust was created um, he literally left government smaller than when he arrived I think people uh, have this uh, incredibly, um, I think, a kind of superficial notion of what, uh, that he was a liberal. He, he actually mm. wasn't a liberal. I mean, he considered himself a pragmatic idealist, maybe. But the bottom line is he was someone who was very, um, very complicated because he mm. wasn't easy to put into a box. And I think one of, of the things that kind of concerns me is that he's being painted as this uber liberal. And that wasn't mm -hmm. who he was. He, he ran government in a, in a relatively efficient way for the times, and um, we, we have to look back at that and with more sober eyes and mm -hmm. just kind of painting it as one thing or another. We often hear that his son is much more uh, conservative economically than his father and socially, you know, as liberal as his father. But if you look back at Andrew Cuomo, at Mario Cuomo's record, excuse me, he he did cut personal income taxes. Mm -hmm. He was a, you know, at the time, we have to remember, as we mentioned, it was the Reagan years. Yeah. He was impacted by the economics of the Reagan era, and he did pursue some of those policies. So, you know, while his son may be more, a little bit more moderate to conservative economically than his father, he certainly had his own moments of trying to 
you know, work within that Reagan era system and, you know, cutting personal income taxes by a tremendous amount was one of his key, you know, his key moments in that. Students of, uh, of heritage and culture will always have respect for him as an Italian American, but I think uh, students of the law, I think they're going to evaluate that. Mm -hmm. What he did, as you mentioned, in terms of appointing uh, so many uh, people of different ethnic backgrounds, mm -hmm. that was a tremendous first in our state. Mm -hmm. That had not happened before. Yeah. And it's left a legacy for his successors. I'm glad you raised that because it's, it's so important. He lived what he preached. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes in government, you, you, you kind of question that. Uh, you knew where Mario Cuomo stood. And if he said inclusion was important, you looked at the appointments that he made, he mm -hmm. was trying to make that point mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And um, as Joe referenced, uh, his successors have, have had to live to that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you could say it was smart politics or good policy. Yeah. Um, and that will definitely be debated through yeah. the years of why he did certain things. The other thing is that he remained steadfast uh, against the death penalty. I remember yeah. in, in 82, when I was working on that campaign, um, he, we lost many people because of uh, his stance on the death penalty. Um, they felt that that was going to be the cure-all. Now, whether you're for or against the, mm -hmm. the death penalties, um, somewhat irrelevant, he, he, that was his position. He felt it was the wrong thing to do, mm -hmm. and he never changed. He famously fought against it. At a time, I think we need to remember, it was so politically unpopular oh. to take that position because crime was so high in New York. He was getting so much opposition. He was building all these prisons, um, and people were really, really frustrated. And one of the answers people looked to was the death penalty. You know, increase, uh, increase, you know, whatever penalties you can to make sure we get these criminals off the street. And he refused steadfastly to, to do that. And I always thought it was something you would see in the profiles in Courage, because in the face of losing an election, he said, I will not change my point of view on this. He's someone who's going to be studied in the years ahead. And I think that will take a long time to do, to evaluate. He did so much in his life, it's hard to remember all the policies that he passed and all the things he did, but the impact on New York, both philosophically, politically, socially, economically, I think is astounding. And so, you know, I think for somebody who kind of stayed in New York, um, and was so committed to New York. I mean, I think we'll remember him as a tried and true New Yorker in the best sense of the word. Within the New York context, mm -hmm. he dispelled the, the belief that you, could, you couldn't win as an Italian-American statewide. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, since then, we've had uh, several uh, mm -hmm. Italian-American governors. Even Governor Pataki Governor is, Pataki, uh, is right. half Italian right. and very proud of the it. The one who unseated him. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you realize that, that there was a ceiling that was broken there. And um, it's not even an issue. It's not even discussed anymore as an yeah. issue. And uh, in this last election, you had uh, Andrew Cuomo running against the uh, county executive of Westchester County, Estorino, who's also Italian-American. Right. And it's not even a, uh, an issue. Right. And that is um, a great step forward for our community yeah. to the point where it's, we don't even talk about it anymore. Well, I like to always think in these terms that I, I see the, the four most powerful positions elect the positions in the state of New York are governor, attorney general, comptroller, and the mayor of New York <laughs> right. City. Yeah. And we have three yeah, out of four. Three out of four. <laughs> when you think of Mario Cuomo, I think you think of one of the most important political figures in American politics, and it's certainly in, in the 20th century. We must be the family of America, recognizing that at the heart of the matter, we are bound one to another, that the problems of a retired school teacher in Duluth are our problems. That the future of the child, that the future of the child in Buffalo is our future. That the struggle of a disabled man in Boston to survive and live decently is our struggle. That the hunger of a woman in Little Rock is our hunger. That the failure anywhere to provide what reasonably we might to avoid pain is our failure. The lack of women in media is a hotly contested issue. Only a small minority of those that comprise 51% of humanity are represented on screen and in various formats. The National Organization of Italian-American Women recognizes this 
and annually commemorates three wise women, be they in media or other industries, at its Epiphany event. This year's honorees are Rosemary Maggiore of Crane's New York Business, Donna Rapaccioli, PhD of the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University, and Roma Torre of New York One News. Italics goes to the Columbus Citizens Foundation Townhouse for the celebration, and correspondent Lucia Grillo had the pleasure of meeting these accomplished and exemplary women. What does it feel like to be honored by these peers, the Italian-American women? I can't even tell you how much it means because I was here about 10 years ago. I was working for Rachel Ray and she was given an honor. It was a, that was my introduction to the organization. I became a member and I brought my mother and we really fell in love with everything it's about. And, you know, I was, my, my whole family is very close to the Cuomo's. So it was just so touching that, you know, last week Mario passed away and his wife is one of the founders. So it just, to me, feels very natural to be part of this organization. Well, I'm very proud of my Italian roots. Um, it comes from my mother's side of the family and I have always adored them. And we are a product of our family and of our experiences. My dad used to say we're the sum total of our experiences. And so to be recognized by the people who I worshiped all my life, you know, my Italian family is what is the, really the only family I know growing up, really means a lot. I and mean, obviously they recognize something in me. Um, they're proud of me and I'm very proud that, that uh, they saw something in me that was worth celebrating. When I think about my success, it really has to do with my Italian-American heritage. The real emphasis on education, a strong work ethic, and family, and a little bit of always having fun really allowed me to get a lot of the things done that I really wanted to do. Malcolm Gladwell says, you should not look just at your parents to figure out why you are the way you are, but your grandparents and even their parents. The hill country of people of Sicily, he uses as an example in his book, The Outliers, and he talks about how we have traits of fierce loyalty, the drive to survive, feeling no fear, working hard and to carry the world forward with the muscle on our backs. The women to nurture a village and protect their families. I see these traits in my family and myself and it's precisely what makes me be proud to be Italian American. I'm a first generation college graduate and growing up the absolute importance of education, a curiosity for learning and the value of hard work were all instilled in me. A little bit about my mom. She grew up in Brooklyn, a very traditional uh, family upbringing. Uh, her parents really didn't speak much English. Um, but she decided in, in high school that she wanted to be a, a journalist. Well, you can imagine how rough it was for an Italian woman. My mom really had two strikes against her. She was Italian and a woman. She ended up with a, a column of her own, a syndicated column in hundreds of newspapers. And my mom was, you know, one of the best writers around, and I'm so happy that, you know, that, that she was recognized uh, for that. When she died, um, a friend of mine said to me, I'm going to put you in touch with this woman who has this rare gift for communing with the afterlife and so you can have some closure with your mother. And I was like, are you kidding? I'm a journalist, I don't believe in that. I'm you know, very skeptical about all this stuff. She said to me, Roma, you know what? You come from a very, very strong family. Now, she didn't know anything about my background at all, but she said, many generations of the women on your mother's side of the family are standing with you. And she, I forget whether she said right or left. She said, but they'll never leave your side. Your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, and like three generations. Uh, beyond that. And she said, so never, never, never lose hope when things are at their worst, but when someone tells you that a group of tough, old Italian women have got your back, <laughs> that I will believe, and I would be a fool not to. Also at the event were Consul General Natalia Quintavalle and Assemblywoman Rebecca Seawright, a friend of Noya whose husband, Jay Hershenson, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor for University Relations, was fundamental in Noya's inception in 1980. Happy 2015 from all of us at Italics. Thanks for watching. Tune in to our next episode airing February 25th. Catch up on previous editions of Italics at cuny.tv 
slash show slash italics and additional webisodes on our italics YouTube channel, italics TV. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.